found feral survivors and bred the ones I liked. I bred the ones that are gentle and the ones that survive and the ones that produce honey. And I don't, I don't uh, claim no. I, I read a lot about bee genetics, but I don't claim to understand it all. Um, so I'm just going to talk about rearing queens right now. I'm just going to do a fairly simple version of queen rearing. And if you want to read some queen rearing books, you can go to my website. Uh, bushfarms.com, you can go look up, I've got uh, Queen Roots by Jay Smith on there, I have Better Queens by Jay Smith on there, I have Allie's Method from his uh, Beekeeping Handy book that he wrote back in the 1800s, I have Doolittle's Scientific Queen Rearing on there, I have Hopkins' original version from his 1886 Australasian Bee Manual on there, and I have the more, the more popularly termed Hopkins Method from Hopkins' 1911 version of that same book. Um, I'll probably add more as time goes on, but those are a lot of them. They're great queen rearing books if you want to read them. As a beginner, what's probably going to happen if you do read them is you'll get overwhelmed with the complexity of what it is they're doing and the manipulations that they're coming up with. And they don't always explain to you why they're doing what they're doing, and so you think, well, I don't see the point in that, so you don't do it. And then when it all fails, you can't figure out why. And, and actually, almost all those manipulations have a reason why they're doing them. Sometimes they're really only critical if the conditions aren't quite right. And that's the trick when you're trying to rear queens to sell to people is you need it to work when the conditions are good and when the conditions are bad. And when the conditions are good, it's easy to rear queens. And when the conditions are bad, it's not so easy to rear queens. And so most of those complex manipulations you read in all those books are because they're trying to consistently get the same amount of queens so that they can sell their queens so they can promise them to their customers year after year, in a drought, in a dirt, in a, in a good year, whatever. So, I'm going to try and stick with the basics here. It'll be a lot simpler than what you're going to read in those books, but I want you to understand when you read those books, why it is they have all these complex manipulations. They did it because over the years of them rearing, rearing queens, they kept finding things that would work more reliably under all conditions. Does that make sense? So, this will be a bit simplified compared to that. Those books will be interesting to read, I just don't want you to get overwhelmed by them, which is why I'm doing this. Um, this is not a picture of one of my queens. This is uh, actually, somebody posted this website on our organics group lately, and I just thought this was a gorgeous picture of what, what a, a, a nice black queen looks like. That's what a lot of my queens look like. Quite a few of them are black. The survivors I tend to find tend to run between black and, and tiger stripe, as D calls them. They're, they're uh, a mixture of mostly, some of them are almost all black workers, and some of them are about half and half black and, and brown, and some of them might lean a little more toward brown, but mostly tend to be toward that. Um, I thought that was a great picture. Okay, why would you want to rear your old queens? Here's my main point, so I'll refer to them in more detail. But cost, time, availability, mite disease resistance. Acrophonized honeybees, which of course he doesn't believe in. Um, so, <laughs> a plant of that is bees and quality. Um, let's look at each of those in turn. If you buy a queen from just your typical queen dealer out there, it probably cost you twenty dollars plus shipping. You might find somebody that's selling them for less. You might find people who are selling them for more. I think weavers are about that, or a little more right now. Uh, bee weaver. Does that sound about right? I don't know. Anyway, that's probably a typical price for a queen these days. If you want them really early in the spring, it'll probably cost you more. And if you want them uh, in bulk, you could probably bring the price down some if you find the right dealer. But basically, that's that's a lot of money for one insect, isn't it? Um, so that's one reason to rear queens. Um, time is another reason to rear queens. And by that, I mean when you find a hive that's queenless, <coughs> The sooner you get a queen in there, the sooner things are going to get set right. The sooner the bees are going to start to improve, the sooner things are going to get headed down the right road. The longer it takes for you to get a queen in there, the further behind that hive is. So one reason to rear queens is so that you can have some on hand. So when you find a queenless hive, you can go, oh, well, I guess I better give them a queen. And you do. Normally, if you don't have queens around, then what do you do? You call readers and... Ten of them tell you, no, we don't have any queens. No, we don't have any queens. No, we don't have any queens. And one finally says, yeah, we got some queens, but I can't ship them until two weeks from now. 
and you go, oh, okay, and because it's, it's the only place you can find, you settle for it, and two weeks later, he finally ships you some, and they get there three days later, and then you put them in a cage, and four days later, the queen finally gets released, and maybe in a month, you actually have them queen right again, and that amount of time, they've been reared their own queen. <laughs> and if you had one on hand, you could have skipped all that. You could have just pretty much introduced the queen and moved on. Availability is the other one, like I said before, quite often your queen list, you start calling queen breeders and none of them have any. And there are times of the year you won't find any queens. Like really early, they're probably all, already all sold out. Right now, they're probably already sold out for April. You probably would have difficulty finding a queen. I would say you couldn't find a queen, but you'd probably have to make a lot of phone calls and, and it would be difficult to find a queen right now if you hadn't already reserved them. And there are just times that they're difficult to find. But I've had bees since 1974, and I've cut out a lot of feral bees in the time, because that's how I, actually that's how I started. I was foolish and young and, and thought I could do anything, so I had no bees, and I went to a cutout. That was my first experience with bees. And it didn't scare me off, I guess, but it was pretty terrifying at times, because um, I had no idea what I was doing, and they were getting madder and madder, and I didn't know what to do about it. But anyway, I've been getting feral bees all my life, and some of them are a little hot, you know, some of them were pretty calm. They varied in temperament. Uh, I never saw anything like what those butt crafts I got from Texas turned into. <laughs> so, if you don't want to get those kind of bees, you might want to raise your own queens from your own area and pick the ones that are nice and, and not take that risk. I think if northern people keep hauling southern bees up north, I don't think it's a good advantage. Um, like re disease resistance is another reason to breed them. Most breeders are not breeding for disease resistance. They breed for color. They breed for temperament. They breed for brood rearing at all times, no matter what the conditions. Because that's what the people who are taking to the almonds want. They want bees who are brood rearing fools, who have no sense that this is a horrible time to be rearing a whole lot of brood, so they can get a big strong hive to take to the almonds. So, if that's not what you want to do, I mean, if you want to take to the almonds, that maybe that's the kind of bees you want. I don't know. But that's not what you want. You might want to bring bees for the characteristics you want. One of those is probably that they survive. Um, pe people argue all the time. When, when, I, when I start saying I raise feral survivors, they say, well, feral survivors aren't very good producers. And I say, well, dead bees aren't very good producers either. So I don't know. I don't, I don't see it as that big of a step down. But uh, I don't think they're that poor producers either. I think you can pick the ones that are better producers. It's not like you can't choose from among the ferals that you collect the ones that have the characteristics that you want and still have bees that will survive. Um, so mite and disease resistance, I, I'm lazy. The easy way to breed for mite and disease resistance is to find bees that are already surviving on their own. They're, obviously they're not dead yet. They must be doing something right. So another argument I hear all the time about collecting swarms is, oh, swarms will be all full of mites and diseases and that's kind of odd to me, because a good, strong hive is the one that swarms, and aren't they the ones that are healthy and doing well? Why do you assume they're the ones that are sick and dying? I don't understand that, that philosophy. But collecting bees that are surviving and keeping the bees that you have that survive gives you a chance to breed for resistance. Tracheal mite resistance really isn't a hard trait to breed for. If you quit treating for tracheal mites, you'll end up with tracheal mite resistant bees, because the rest of them will die. Does that sound mean and cruel? Well, if you find one that's not tracheal mite resistant, requeen it. If you don't want to let them die. That's, I, I've never been in favor of just letting them die. If the problem is the genetics, then requeen them. If you've got a hive that seems susceptible <coughs> to disease, requeen it. Don't, don't, don't let them die, but don't, don't breed bees from those bees. That's just foolish. You don't want to breed bees that can't live. So, my disease resistance is something you can breed for. Really, there aren't very many breeders out there breeding for that. They're just trying to produce a lot of queens. What their goal is, is to have X number of queens by this date so I can ship them to my customers. Their goal is not to have my disease resistant bees to ship to my customers. That's not their goal. But acclimatized bees. I think, that this is one of those controversial things, but actually surprise how many of your bee scientists would agree with this, that we need acclimatized bees. We need bees that do well in our climate. If you raise bees from the feral survivors in your climate, 
and then you raise queens from those to raise your own queens, then you're going to get bees that are coming <coughs> close to your client. If you keep buying <coughs> bees from Georgia that do well in Georgia, you're going to get wonderful queens that do really good in Georgia, but that doesn't mean they're going to do well in Massachusetts or New York or Michigan or Minnesota. So I think another reason to raise your own queens is to get bees that are acclimatized to your climate. For some reason, everybody, no, maybe I do know the reason. The, the bee magazines, who runs the ads in the bee magazines? There's two groups of people in the bee magazines who are running ads, who are paying for your magazine. You know who they are? Any suggestions? Well, people that sell equipment. People that sell equipment and? People that sell bees. People that sell queens and maybe some bees, but mostly queens. But um, when was the last time you saw an article in a bee magazine on how to raise your own queens? I don't see very many of them. <laughs> Why is that? It's not that difficult to do, but you never see articles on it because they want to discourage you from raising your own queens. They want you to buy their queens. Um, the people who support the magazines make money selling queens. Everybody seems to act like if you raise your own queens, the quality won't be as good. And that's just foolishness. It's not true at all. They have no stake in the quality of those queens other than their reputation. They don't. If, if that queen needs to be replaced every year, which is what they're all telling you to do, because they say they aren't any good after a year, then you just buy more queens. If that queen fails, what do you do? You buy another queen. They, they've got no stake in the quality of these queens. You do. You have a stake in this. They don't have a stake in this. Their stake is to sell you more queens. I'm not saying they're all being dishonest. I'm just saying there's no big motivation for them to try to raise really high quality queens. That's my point. I'm not saying they're trying to rip you off or not rip you off. I'm just saying they, they don't have a stake in this. There's no incentive. So you have an incentive. You can do things like this is just one example of things you can take the time to do. If you leave a, if you breed a queen, you leave it in that uh, mating nuke or, or actually introduce it to the hive you want to put it in in the first place, and you leave her in there and let her lay for 21 days, or better yet, and like I said, introduce her to the hive and put her in anyway, you never cage her up and put her in a queen bank at all, she'll be a better queen than one that's been banked. The one that's been pulled out, stuck in a cage, put in the queen bank. Especially if they get pulled out before they've laid very long. Two, three weeks has been, this is scientific research again here, that, that three weeks their ovarials have developed a lot more than if you pull them out at two weeks. If you let them emerge two weeks later, they're just barely laying eggs, you pull them out and bank them, they will not be as good layers as if you let them lay for three weeks before you pull them out and bank them. So, here's some queen cells. There's one there, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. <coughs> Those are swarm cells. It was on foundation of spring. And they built, if you ever watched how they build, they built, they built a loop here, they built a loop here, and this is right where the two loops were coming together. And they decided they want to rear a bunch of queens. They tend to do it right along those edges like that when they're on a natural home. And on a frame, they don't have those edges, and so then they tend to like go them off the bottom, wherever they can find them. Okay, if you want to rear queens, you have to fool the bees into raising queens, into raising queens right? So why, do queen, why do bees raise queens? Well, these are the conditions under which they raise them. Most people list three, I list four, because I think there's a significant difference between three and four there. But um, there really isn't a significant difference in the end result. There is a significant difference in the motivation of what caused them to do it. The first one is an emergency queen. If you take a queen out of the hive, what do they do? They start queen cells because they know they can't live without a queen and they need a queen. The second one is supersedure. That's where they sense that the old queen's not making enough pheromones anymore. Um, there's something wrong. She's laying too many drones that they're having to clean out. I don't, know what, I don't know what all the motivations are that cause them to do that, but I've noticed quite often I'll think that a, that a queen is fine and they decided to supersede her, and I'm thinking, man, I like that queen. I want to raise some more queens off of her. So I pull those supersedure cells out and go stick them in a nuke because I figure I don't want to waste them because I, I like this queen. And I come back and a week, a week later she's still there. There's no eggs. There's no brood. She's not laying anything anymore. Mm. I don't know how they knew she was going to quit, but they did, and I didn't. I was wrong, so <laughs> I have to give them a queen back now and get them going again. Somehow or another, they sense the queen's about to fail, and they, re and they replace her. The next one is reproductive swarming. I think reproductive swarming is a whole combination of things, but they, it's basically the goal of every hive in spring. Their intention is to reproduce this hive, if they can, without endangering 
this, the success of the, the current hive. In other words, if they can do it without risking this current hive dying, they're going to swarm. That's what they do. So they're, they're, all their instincts are based around the concept of trying to assess the situation and decide, can we cast a swarm? We'll still do well and that swarm will do well. And if they can cast a swarm before the main flow, that's usually a reproductive swarm because then that, that swarm, the main flow would build up on it, get ready for winter and have a good chance of making it. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. trying to, if you're trying to control swarming, you need to understand this even more because this is more difficult to head off than this. This, all you have to do is throw supers on. This, you have to fool them into thinking this isn't a good time to reproduce. Um, overcrowding swarming, basically any time you crowd a hive enough, though they'll, they'll, it's almost a population control thing. It's like, we've got too many mouths to feed, we've got too many bees here, we can't deal with this. We need... For the amount of space we've got, we need less, we need less bees. So they cast a swarm, basically, as a, as a means of population control. So they'll get a new queen out of it, they get rid of some of the bees, now we've got a, a hive that's more manageable, more likely to make it through the winter because we don't have so many mouths to feed. So an overcrowded swarm, it's a little different motivation. It's basically, we're out of room. We've got too many bees and we're out of room. Uh, there are probably several things that contribute to that, like ventilation seems to help on overcrowded swarming, and, and more room seems to help, but that's the main one we need to in. So here, there's our reasons. Emergency, there's suddenly no queen. It's in procedure, they think she's failing. Reproductive, uh, they've got enough resources to reproduce without the nature of the colony. And overcrowding, there's just too many bees and they're going to make adjustments. When you're trying to rear queens, you have to, you have to create at least one of those situations in order to get them to want to rear queens. The best quality queens seem to come from uh, probably simulating both emergency and overcrowding. Everybody says emergency queens aren't as good. Well, that, that's, that's one of those beekeeping sayings. If you just make a hive queenless and they raise a queen, there are times that queen's pretty good and there's times that queen's not so good. Uh, it probably depends on a lot of factors. One of those factors is the uh, Old brood cells have a lot of cocoons in them. Bees can't easily tear them down. When you make them queenless, they have to start with what they've got. They've got they can't build a queen cell and then have a queen lay in the queen cell because there's no queen to lay in the queen cell. So their only option is to try and tear down one of these cells and build a queen cell around it, which would work fine if they can tear it down. But when it's got all these cocoons in it, they can't easily tear it down. And so instead they build a queen cell coming out from it this way, and they float the larva out by feeding it to get it to come out into the cell, and it never gets fed quite as well as one that's built right up against where the where the larva is. So if you do an emergency uh, queen, and they don't have to tear the cell wall down, either because it's on new comb, which is easy for them to tear down, or because you tore it down for them so they didn't have to tear it down, or because you put them in a queen cup like most people do when they graft so that it's already faced in the right direction and again they don't have to tear it down. They don't build, an, they don't really make an inferior queen just because it's an emergency situation. They build an inferior queen because they just can't feed that queen as well under the circumstances that you put them in. So emergency is a good thing, but overcrowding not only motivates them to want to rear queens more and rear more queens for you when you go through this process, but the more bees there are, the better fed the queens are. The better fed the queens are, the better the quality of the queens are. Number one thing, people like to think genetics is the number one thing for the quality of the queen, and they're certainly important. But you can have the best genetics in the world, if they don't get fed well, you're going to have a poor queen. So, I'm not saying the genetics don't matter, but genetics won't matter if you don't get them fed well. <laughs> so you need to get them fed well. And overcrowding is how you get them fed well that and making sure there's food to feed them, but you've got to have a lot of bees to take good care of a lot of queens because they have to produce an awful lot of royal jelly to feed all those queens. Does that make sense? Okay, so why do we want to do queen rearing? All we have to do really to get a queen is do a split, right? One raise, raise a queen, you just got a queen. Does that make sense? And that's what a lot of hobbyists do. And there's, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But there is a reason why people do queen rearing. Um, what we really want to do is get the highest number, the highest quality of queens with the least amount of resources. In other words, I just split. Well, let's look at the. 
I take a strong hive and I do a split. It's going to take them 24 days from there until they've got a line queen, give or take four or five days. But pretty much 24 days is a pretty good guess. In 24 days, they're probably going to have a lane queen again. In that 24 days, that big strong hive could have raised, that the queen would have laid several thousand eggs a day. They would have raised all those thousands of brood. In that 24 days, they would have raised at least several thousand, probably 30,000 workers or so they could have raised in that amount of time. And I just deprived them of 30,000 workers to get one queen. That's just not a good investment of resources. They probably raised 15, 20 queen cells. First queen out killed all the rest of them. I actually had 15 queens, but I ended up with one. So, for a loss of resources of about 30,000 workers, and a hive that's now in turmoil because they're queenless, which they, so they don't have the, the same morale as, I, I know the scientists probably don't really care for the term morale, but, but uh, I think it's obvious that bees have morale. The difference between a hive that's just been really banged around and one that's just been banged around a little bit is, is totally different. When you bang around a little bit, it's angry. When you bang around a lot, it's just lost hope. But you didn't upset the morale. You didn't deprive them of 30,000 uh, workers. And, uh, well, anyway, you deprived them of 30,000 workers and cleaning all that for 24 days, and all you got was one clean. Okay, so let's say I, I try to tip that scale a little bit and make it more efficient. So now I take a small nuke to shake lots of bees in so the queens will get well fed. And this isn't a bad method either because you just want a few queens. Take a five frame nuke, shake lots of bees in so it's pretty much overflowing, make them queenless, and make sure they've got some eggs on a nuke home, they'll probably raise you some nice queen cells. Uh, but again, unless I go in and cut out those queen cells, I end up with one queen. I still made a fair number of bees queenless and only got one queen because the first one out killed all of them. But at least I made less of the queens and end up with one queen. But, um, so the concept of queen rearing really is to try and get a lot of queens for not so much resources. I'm trying to make less bees queenless. I'm trying to not deprive them of a lot of workers and, and the benefit of having a queen while ending up a maximum number of queens of, of decent quality. The other reason that people do queen rearing is they want to select the mother of the offspring. In other words, this might be a hive that I can do a split on, but does it really have the qualities I want? If I just do a split on this hive, I end up with one queen from this hive. But if I've got a really awesome queen over there that I think I'd like a whole lot of offspring from, how do I get a whole lot of offspring from that queen that I've chosen as being the genetics that I really want? So the other advantage of queen rearing is I, I get to select the mother of the offspring that I end up with. Queens lay, a queen lays an egg. Um, there's no difference between a worker egg and a queen egg. They're just a fertilized egg. And for the first four days, it's just an egg. It's not being fed, it's just being kept warm and humid from the humidity from the bodies of all, and the respiration of bees. Humidity's a little higher level than outside, and the temperature's about 93, and, and but under those conditions, this egg will hatch. Okay. So the point this egg hatches, there's absolutely no difference between a queen and a worker. And they start feeding them for the first there's people who argue how long they're fed precisely the same thing, but there's no doubt for at least the first 12 to 24 hours they're being fed precisely the same thing. A lot of people say for the first 48 hours or so at least they're being fed precisely the same thing. Probably anywhere in that range you'll end up with a pretty good queen if you grafted them in that range. I always go for as young as I can get them. If they're hatched, that's perfect. If they're just hatched and they've got a little pool of, a little tiny pool of jelly in there, they're so small you can't even see them. They're just a, a, an imperfection in, the, in that little pool of jelly. I love those. That's, that's great. But, but I, I get pretty good queens from them if they're a little bigger. You see the larvae in here. These are a little older. They're a little bigger than I would normally uh, graft unless I just couldn't find anything smaller. But they're not, they're not too big to graft. But they're bigger than I usually do graft. I usually go for something a little smaller. Um, so queens come from, from, from a fertilized egg. So if you take that larva right there and put it in a hive that wants to rear queens in something that fools them from thinking it's a queen cell, they'll make a queen cell out of it. That's the basic premise of, uh, of most queen rearing systems. So the first step is we need to get larva of the right age. And there are several methods to do that. 
Um, once you have an eye for it, all you really have to do is look, if you're grafting, all you really have to do is look through the hive and find the larva of the right age, because you know what it looks like. If you don't know what it looks like yet, then the thing to do is control where the queen's laying so you know precisely the age of the, of the eggs and larvae you're looking at, and you'll get a feel for how, how large a larva of a given age is, and once you, once you get the hang of that, you can do it however you want. But it is convenient to know that I can pull this one frame out, and the larva on this one frame are going to be exactly the age I want. It, it's much easier when you're grafting to not have to keep looking through the hive trying to find the right age. Because what happens is the queen's in the hive, she's, she lays here for a while, takes a break, and then she lays over here for a while, she takes a break. And so probably there's only one or two frames in the whole hive that are the exact age I want. I've got to look through them all to try and find that one. If I, if I can find the queen on the comb, then I know 24 hours later I let her go. I know four days from when I can find her on there, they're exactly the right age, and I, and I know which frame they're on because I put her there. Does that make sense? This is a Jenner box. It has a little, I don't have a picture of it, but there's a little thing that goes over it that's, a, that's made out of plastic that's like a queen excluder. It's got little gaps for the port <coughs> in and out. And you can find the queen in it. It even has a little hole in the middle so you can let the queen in that hole. You, I've done it both ways. You can just set her on here and put the whole thing on, or you can pop that little thing off and run her in the hole and then put the little cap on the hole. But either way, you now have a queen confined on here. And if this is in the middle of a brood nest where there's open brood here and open brood here, and she's here, she lays in there, and then a day later I let her out, and then they'll start raising this brood. Now, if I put that somewhere other than between two combs of open brood, and it's, it's iffy. It depends on how strong the hive is what they're going to do with that. They, you know, in the middle of the brood nest, of course, there's a bunch of nurse bees. They'll run over there and start feeding them. If it's up in a super, well, that's not where the nurse bees are hanging out, so it, they might. If it's a really crowded hive, some worker or another might go, oh, hey, I better feed these, but they might not. So it needs to be in the brood nest. But if you do that, you'll get some that you know how old they are. But the purpose of this is a little more complicated, and I'll talk about it more later. This my, my method usually, if I'm going to grab, is to take a number five hardware cloth and make a push-in cage about this big and put it on the, and I'll show, a pic, I'll show a picture of it in a minute here. But uh, and it serves the same purpose. It finds the queen on the column. Do a little method. Gene Doolittle uh, published this back in the late 1800s. Scientific Queener. You can read the whole book if you'd like. I have it on my website. It's free. It costs you nothing. You may as well enjoy it. I had a terrible time finding one. I spent years finding one, and I just wanted to save you the trouble. So, if you want to read it, it's a very good book. Basically, he didn't really invent anything. He just put it together and organized it into a system and put it in a book. Um, a guy named uh, Nickel, I think he's a German guy named Nickel, who first, uh, who first grafted larva and raised queens. And then Sirach duplicated that. And then Huber duplicated that. And then GM Doolittle duplicated that. But GM Doolittle actually put it in a book as a queen rearing method, where the other guys just kind of did his little experiment that was interesting. But he actually turned it into a queen rearing method. So he gets his name on it, even though he didn't exactly invent it. But the method is that you get some of the right age larva, and you put them in wax cups that resemble a queen cell. You put them in a bar, you put them in a queenless or, and or overcrowded, one or the other or both, hide and get them to rear queens on them. And then when the queens are uh, two days from emerging, you put them in mating nukes and which is some queenless bees in a little nuke, and let them emerge, and then those bees will take care of them, and she'll fly out and mate and start laying, and now you've got another queen. That's the short version. Does that make sense? Today, he, he made wax cups. He took a basically a dowel. He wanted to make a lot of them, so he ended up getting a rake that had was one of those old time, time rakes that was just wooden, a wooden rake with wooden dowels that stuck out like this. That's what he started out when he wanted to make a bunch of them. That's what he started using. He tapered the ends of them, dip it in water to get it soak up a little water and then dip them in wax and start with them like this deep and then get shallow and shallower so the base was nice and thick and the edge was nice and thin and then he'd pull those off and then he'd graft into them and then he'd stick, use some melted beeswax to stick them on a, on a strip of wood and put that in a frame and put it in a hive. So that was his method. Um, usually people who do this today, uh, you, you can combine clean with the number five hardware cloth Caged, so you know where she is and where she's laying. Some people just stick an empty comb in the middle of the brood nest and assume that's probably where she's going to lay. 
a good bet she probably will, but especially with this crowded brood nest, because that's where the empty space is, and it's in the middle of the nest. But, but if you can find her, you know she'll lay in it, and that's not hard to do, but then it requires another trip to let her go. You have to go find her, confine her, and then let her go, which is really time consuming. Um, usually people use old dark brood comb to do this, so that for two reasons, you can see the larva better against the dark um, bottoms of the cells, which is one of the reasons why Max Handy here makes the black honey supercell, so you can, if you want to graph queens, you can see the larva in the bottom better, you can see the eggs better, you can see because it's dark. The other, the other reason for using an old dark comb is that it's tougher, and you're trying to graft it, and you're less likely to poke through the bottom of the cell when you're trying to get underneath the larva to pick it up, because you really want to get under the larva and pick it up. You're not just trying to like stab it and pull it out of there. You know, you're trying to not to not hurt it. You want to get under it and gently lift it up. And to do that, you pretty much have to follow the back of that cell. And if it's brand new wax, it tends to poke through the wax. It doesn't go under it very well. So usually that's not an old dark wax. Um, the Jenner method, you saw the other side of this cage before, <coughs> the back side of it. The back side of it has plugs. Basically every other cell of every other row has a plug in it. A little, I, I meant to bring some, but I was when I was packing, I didn't get it done. But, but basically, it's a little plug that fits in there that makes the bottom of the cell from the other side. And then you can find the queen on there, and she lays in it. You let her go. Four days later, you have the right age larva. So you pull these plugs out, and if your eyesight's not real good, just pull them all off, put them all in there, and don't worry about it. But if your eyesight's good, half the reason a lot of people use this is because it's difficult. So the difficulty of grafting is you have to be able to see something. It's extremely tiny at about this distance in order to get it out and graft it. And people who are over 40 tend to have a little bit of difficulty with it. And people who are over 50 tend to have more difficulty with it. And it gets worse as time goes on. So one of the nice things about this is, A, you know how old the larva is. But B, you don't have to have good eyesight to do it. But if you've got good enough eyesight, you can look at all these plugs. And if they don't have a larva in them, you can just discard them and don't bother with them. But your eyesight's not that good, just put them all in and it'll work. The, the bees know which ones have eggs in them, or which ones have larvae in them, it'll work out. But you pull those out, you put them in a, in a plastic cup that, that looks like a queen cell hanging down, like a queen cup when they build a cup for the queen to lay in. And then that fits inside a little plastic uh, base that gives you something to give it some support. You want to put it like between, between two frames, you could squeeze that and you wouldn't squeeze the queen cell. You know, it gives a little bit of of, of uh, support. And then those fit inside of a bar that, that fits on a frame just like every other clean room method. The main advantage to this is you don't have to learn how to graft. You don't have to be that, that uh, dexterous and you don't have to have that good eyesight. But you have to buy this thing which is uh, about 60 bucks I think for a kit last I priced it. Um, there's that number five high hardware cloth. The number five is just small enough that the workers can get in there to feed the queen and take care of her, and the queen can't get through it. And then, so you can find her for 24 hours, then you take that off, and then when the eggs hatch, they've got full access to it to feed those larvae. So there's a, that, that frame's actually upside down. There's the top bar, and there's the bottom bar, you know, but there's the, the uh, cage. The Hopkins method, Again, you don't have to confine the queen. You can just gamble and stick a brand new comb in there and hope the queen lays on it the first day and go check and see if she did. Come back the next day and see if she laid on in it then. But from when the queen laid in it, four days later, you want to you do the rest of this. If you can find her, then you know what day she laid in it. If you don't confine her, then you'll have to go see when she laid the eggs. But um, Basically, this should be new comb so that the bees can tear it down and rebuild it. Uh, take a frame of new comb, confine the queen in it or stick it in there. Uh, Fourth day, you're going to take this and you're going to destroy every other row of larva, and then you're going to go through. In fact, a lot of people destroy, leave one and destroy two rows, and leave one and destroy two rows. The idea is you want to leave some gaps so that when they build these queen cells, they run all in clusters where you can't separate them. So by destroying either one or two rows in between each of them, and then either one or two cells in between each of them, you've spaced out all the larva on this in this space. So all these queen cells can easily be cut out when they're ready to put, go to a mating loop without, just without injuring the queen cell. Does that make sense? So you're going to just 
there a lot of people do a lot of different things. I think Hopkins last night really basically he took the knife and just uh, kind of cut out the wall and left the bottom. I mean, like two cuts to kind of cut out the wall and then just took some blunt thing and went down the middle and just, you know, not, not the rest of it down, go down through the middle. Um, Allie says you take the kind of a match, you know, a kitchen match, and you just, just because it's kind of round and blunt, you can just squish them all, put on a line. Um, whatever, as long as you uh, get them so the gaps between them. <clears throat> I built a shim like this. Hopkins, uh, in, in Pellet's version of the Hopkins method, he shows a picture of a shim like this. In uh, the Hopkins version, he just says if you're on a big, strong 10 frame pie, you just take a frame and angle it like this, and you stick an empty frame underneath it to hold it up. Because you need it up high enough for them to be able to build, build the queen cells hanging down. So what you're doing is you're laying the cell, this, this frame, it was like this, you're laying it flat like this. So that now all the cells are oriented down like a queen cell instead of sideways like a worker cell. And you need that suspended over the hive, over the brood nest. So Hopkins' method was you got a 10 frame box, if you take an empty frame and lay it there for a spacer to hold it up, and then you lay the, the frame on top of that, and then you've got your space. And you've got a kind of angle, you stick an empty box on there so that you can get it in at an angle. You realize your problem is that it won't fit inside because it's too long. You know, at an angle it'll fit inside, but straight it won't fit inside. So you've got to angle it a little. And then you throw whatever, a, a, a rug, a quilt, a, an old piece of cloth, whatever on top of that to just kind of keep warm and keep the bees from getting up in there and trying to build comb up in, the, in that empty box. And uh, I just built the shim on a five frame box. If you shake plenty of these in here, you gotta make sure you got plenty of these in there, but we'll get into that more as we go. But if you got plenty of these in there, you can even do this over a starter box, which we'll talk more about a starter box in a minute. But uh, I built this to go over a five frame, and that's a medium frame, because that's what I run as all mediums. This is a five frame dude. But you could build one that's bigger than take a ten frame one and hold it over a ten frame box, and you might want to fill in the uh, gaps or you can leave them, it doesn't matter. Main thing is uh, that it's suspended right over the brood nest. So that they'll come up and uh, feed those queens. Uh, and then when the. I'm always counting from the baby eggs later. Day 14, you're going to be two days from when they're going to emerge. You need to cut them out from the baby nukes or put them in the hydro cleaning or whatever. Um, these are some other methods. All those books are in my, uh, on my website if you want to go read those. Books and read about those methods. I'm not going to go into the details. The better queens method basically is the same as the Hopkins method, except you cut those into strips and you wax them onto bars and you put them in the middle of the hive. But other than that, it's the same thing. New comb, uh, destroy every other row, whole thing, pretty much the same. Alley's pretty much the same thing, except on old comb instead of new comb. But to me, this was the trickiest thing when I started raising queens, is getting them started. Get them to finish them. In a drought, it can be a little tricky, but in, in good times, when there's a flow, it's usually not hard to get them to finish them. It's, the trick is getting them to start. The books go into a lot of details on how to get cells started. To me, all of them really come down to the, the most important issue, which is you need that cell starter overflowing with bees, literally. If it's not packed with bees, you're not going to get good results. If it's just so, so, population of bees, you're not going to get really good results at getting a lot of cells started. If you've got lots of bees, you're probably going to have pretty good results. Um, there are other things that are issues, but that's probably the number one issue. And most of those schemes that everybody comes up with are some way to end up with a lot of overcrowded, queenless bees who want to feed some queen cells. So, keep that in mind, if that's the underlying principle, then you're probably less likely to mess up when you're trying to do any of these. You're thinking, well, I did this manipulation and this manipulation, and therefore it should have worked. But the bottom line is, did you end up with it all packed with bees? Because <laughs> if you didn't, it's probably not going to work. So, so just because you did, you know, I did put bees here and did this and did whatever, that's not really going to make it work. What's going to make it work is that it's just overflowing with bees. Most of those manipulations are intended to create that end result. So keep that in mind that that's your goal. And then... You can use whatever method you think is appropriate, but that's that's basically your goal. This is one of the methods to do that. It's called the cult board, um, sometimes called a floor without a floor. 
because basically you can have a divider in between two parts of the hive and you can remove that divider, which means I can have a queen down here below a queen excluder, and then I can have more boxes up here, and I can have the rearing queens up here, and I can, by doing nothing more than just pulling this board out, manipulate it so that now it's queen right. And I can also play around with where the inferences face to manipulate the bees to end up with this being overcrowded when I'm going to get them started. So the whole idea of this is to try and manipulate the bees to end up with most of the bees up here and to manipulate it so that the queen can't get to here to destroy them when I make a queen right later. Now why would you want a queen right self starter or self finisher? It, that when you're raising queens, if you have a queenless starter finisher, it's pro if, and you're raising your first batch of queens, it's probably pretty it's pretty reliable. It's really pretty pretty good bet they're not going to tear all the queen cells down. You're probably going to get them all the way to the point you want and put them in your paintings. Second batch is a little more iffy because you really got to be careful there aren't any queen cells in there because they probably tried to raise one someplace you didn't know about. Plus, they're starting to lose their motivation. They got all they got all rallied around. We need a queen. Let's raise a queen. Let's raise a queen. And now they've been working at it for a while. And they're just about to the point where they think, ah, we can breathe easier now. And then what do you do? You take all the queens away. And now you go, what? Wait a minute. We, we were supposed to have a queen now. Where's the queen? And, and they start losing morale after after two batches. I, it's not even worth messing with them if you're doing them queenless. The idea of this is that you can have them queenless to get them started, and then you can make them queen right again so they get to breathe a little easier while they finish these cells. Um, you can get by fine without that simply by using a bottom board, putting it in and taking it out, except you've got to lift the boxes off and put them back on. So do you need to buy this piece of equipment? Well, if you're rearing a lot of queens, it might save you some labor. If you're not, you can probably just stick a bottom board on there and, and, and get by without it. Um, Why wouldn't they want to tear down those cells, Mike, once you make them queen right again? They're building the cells because they're, they're queenless. Well, let, let's try it from another point of view. Let, let's try demarine, or at least a simplified demarine. I'll just call it a simplified demarine. If I if I had a queen down here, a queen excluder here, um, some honey here, some brood here, odds are they would raise a queen here anyway. Because the queen can't get up here, and there's no queen there's not enough queen pheromones up here to convince them that they have a queen. They would probably rear a queen anyway. Yeah. So why wouldn't they tear them down? Well, the queen can't get up there to spread queen pheromones around to convince them that they should tear them down. So, and it doesn't always work. The problem with all, a lot of these things, like I said, a lot of these books are so complicated in their, in their methods because sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes. But queenless is more likely to be 100% in the sense that they, uh, they, they know they're queenless. They're going to raise at least one queen. They're probably going to raise most of them. Where as soon as I make a queen right again, well, probably they're going to keep those queen cells. But on the other hand, they might get wild here and go, wait a minute, I think we got a queen. I think we can tear these down. We don't need these. Okay. And I'm more likely to do that in dearth, where they're thinking, why do we want to waste all those feet on all those food on all those queen cells up there? We got a queen. We don't need to do that. And and a dearth is usually when they want to swarm either, so they, they kind of lose their their motivation. Um, that's a that's a grafting uh, tool made out of a toothpick up there at the top. It's a picture from one of Doolittle's books, in case you're wondering what that is. Um, the simplest way to make a self starter is just take a good strong colony and take a clean out and cut it down to minimum space. In other words, if I got this big strong colony and I find the queen and I take her out, I take all the supers off, pull her in, take them all off, crowd them down into that brood nest. It makes a great cell starter because pretty much you know, I just put them in a state to swarm and I put them in a state, I put them in an overcrowding condition because I pulled all the supers off and I took their queen out so I put them in an emergency condition so they want a queen and that, that's a pretty simple, reliable way for, for, a, for an amateur who just wants to raise one good big batch of queen cells once a year. It's a pretty reliable way to end up with a bunch of queen cells. Unfortunately, you're probably going to destroy the production on this hive from here by doing all this because you just and clean list and crowd them up. But you'll probably get a pretty good batch of queen cells out of it. Um, the other thing you gotta do is make sure there's no other queen cells in the hive. Because if you had a good strong hive, they might have been planning on swarming and you didn't notice that. And if there's another queen cell in there, they will destroy all your queen cells when they emerge. So you, you gotta keep an eye on that.
This is another method that's very popular. Uh, Alley came up with this as a means to convince them that they were queenless, and Jay Smith took it a step further and used it to actually get the cells started. Alley would do this to get them queenless, to get them convinced they were queenless, and then put them back in the hive and give them the cells. Jay Smith would put them in this and then put the cells in here along with some honey and pollen and get them to start the cells. But basically, you shake a bunch of bees into a box. You, you've got to have a lot of ventilation because it's going to be really packed with bees, which is why you put the screen wire here. I just took a, I run medium, so I took a deep, added a three quarter to make a bottom in case I ever wanted to put deep frames in it or something. So probably didn't need to, but just in case. And then I screened the bottom, and then I'm going to make a screen lit up here. And then I put uh, uh, just a board on each side to hold it up off the ground so it can get air in there. Because you guys get lots of ventilation because you're going to pack this with bees. And basically you shake a bunch of bees in here. The more different eyes you shake them in from, probably the better this will work. Because the more confusion there is, the more they tend to really work at getting organized as to what we need to do now. And when what they need to do now is raise a, raise a queen, then you're going to get a lot of queen cells. So if you shake in a couple of frames from one hive, a couple of frames from another hive, a couple of frames from another hive, a couple of frames from another hive, of course making sure you don't have a queen on them, and of course shaking them all off a of brood home so that you've got nurse bees, and you've got this box full of nurse bees. So now you stick them in a dark, cool place like the basement, if your wife will let you, or the shade under the tree if that's the best you can do. And uh, in about two hours, they started to get organized. They get, they get all clustered up in here. Basically, you have a frame of pollen, a frame of honey, a frame of pollen, a frame of honey, and you have to have some source of water. Jay Smith would just take a spray bottle and spray water on the honeycomb so that they're just dripping with water so that they'd have some water to water that honey down with. Uh, Marla Spivik's method is you take a big old sponge like this and you dip it in the bucket and get it really soaked and you put it on the bottom down here. And then they can suck water off of that sponge. But they got to have some source of water here because between now and when you get them to raise queen cells, it takes a lot of water for them to generate all that royal jelly and for them not to get too hot and die. Is that new, new box work for that? Yes. But it's going to have more it's going to have to have more ventilation in the regular box. So in this, case, in, there. in this case he built one that's a little taller and put the screen wire here, but if you just took a regular new box and, well see I, um, I'm going to get iffy on you here, but the problem is ventilation. So you really need more space on the bottom. Now, since I'm doing mediums, the heat gets more space on the bottom, so that works pretty well for me. I got an extra three inches down there already, and then I screen the bottom. So, uh, if you're running deeps and you're using a deep nuke box, you really need that extra space down here, you, just for ventilation purposes. So and you just block them in there. So then, yeah, then they're blocked in here. This needs to be pretty much be tight. So you need a good square flat lid, and you might even need to duct tape it around to make if you're going to put it in the basement, so they don't start wandering out. That's mm. That's not a good thing to have a lot of bees in your basement. I can tell you that firsthand. <laughs> Doesn't go over well with the rest of the family. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, maybe some of you can talk about what time it is. Right. I'll talk about timings. Yeah. Um, but basically, you want to do this two hours before you're going to graft your queens. You do this, you graft your queens, and you put them in there um, like two hours after you ship them in there. Two hours is enough. Ali says, now, Alex says I'm much more. I don't remember how much he did. But Jay Smith says two hours is enough to know they're queenless, and, and two hours works fine. In two hours, they pretty much realize they're queenless, they're confused, and they need to raise the queen really badly. And you have a whole bunch of nurse bees with no larvae to feed, and so waiting more than two hours, they'll start shutting down and producing food. Right now, they're still at maximum food production, and they had thousands of larvae that these bees were feeding, and now they've got nothing to feed, and now you put a bunch of queen cells in got nothing to feed but these queen cells. So they get really well fed. That's that's the purpose of this. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, this is just some bee man that you're going to need to know why the timing comes out the way it does. You need to keep this one in mind because there's no point you start to rear queens if you aren't going to have drones to make them with. So, the simple rule, my rule is, if I got the drones flying, I can raise queens. Because by the time the queen is done, they'll be mature enough to be flying in the drone congregation area. So I, I don't have to worry about it. You're trying to cut it really close, which I'm not. Um, basically, it's 38 days from the time you've got some drone being laid here to when they're going to be going to the drone congregation area. If you want to try and cut it down to that 
38 days, then we need to realize it's going to be basically 16 days before you're going to have to worry about the clean thinking about flying out to go make. So subtract 16 from 38, you need to... Uh, I'm too early in the morning. 22? I need 22 days from the time I see some grown eggs before I, before I start bringing the cleans to know that I'm going to have... But basically, if you've got drones flying, they're going to be old enough by, this, by 16 days from then. The 16 plus 24 is 40, right? And 38 is what I needed. So if I've got them flying right now, they're going to be old enough by the time the screen emerges. Does that make sense? But that's why I put that math up there so you can understand the concept. That's why I have to have, queen, I have, to have drones flying now to know I'm going to have drones to make with my queen that I'm going to start raising now. I can't assume that those drones are going to emerge on day 24 at the same time as my queen and, and think they're going to go out, that there's going to be drones with my queen. If the bees aren't rear drones, if they're just starting to rear drones, I'm still a little too early to start my queens. I don't think that those drones are flying and then I can see And the queen, it's, it's this point, three and a half, between three and a half and four is when I'm trying to do my graphing. I'm really shooting for four because I want them a little bit older than than three and a half. I don't want them just hatched. I want them to have a little bit of, I want some royal jelly in there with them, and there's not much royal jelly in them right when they hatch. About a half a day later, there's a lot of royal jelly in there, and that's just perfect. So I'm shooting for four days when I want to, when I want to graft them, and then they're going to be capped at eight, and once they're capped, I don't need them in a cell finisher, a cell starter anymore. I could, if I want to, have a separate cell finisher where I just have them in a state where I don't think they'll tear the cells down and keep the cells in there while I start more cells in my cell starter again. But, but that's the point at which they get capped. They're going to emerge at 16. On a hot day, they'll emerge on really hot weather. Sometimes they'll emerge at 14. That's not very often. 14 is usually a pretty safe bet for, for when I'm going to take them out and put them in my mating juice. But 15 is pushing my luck because in hot weather, uh, they'll almost always emerge on 15 in really hot weather. All right. let, let the bees get all over it, put their smell on it. It'll, it'll probably improve the odds. And this is all about odds. They're not going to build every single queen cell, and not every queen, single queen cell is going to make it either. So you're, you're really talking about just trying to stack the deck to be in your favor. So I put, put anything in there that you want to get covered with bee smell on about four days before you're going to start. On day zero, if I'm going to confine the queen, that's when I'm going to confine her. Uh, like I said, if you're an experienced grafter, you could probably just walk out to a hive and pull out a frame and go, no, 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 okay, that's a good one, and go graft. And actually, sometimes I end up doing that, because sometimes the bees don't do what you think they'll do. You can find a queen, and you let her go, and there are eggs in there. When you come back to get them on day four, there's nothing in there. They cleaned them out. They just decided they didn't want to raise that brood. And so now I go, I need queens. <laughs> So I go find another box and find some larvae and I start grafting. I don't usually plan to graft a lot. I usually use my Jenner box, but I end up grafting now and then because they just don't do what I want. And I didn't have a queen confined, but I just need to do it. It's also nice when you're going to an out yard to get to skip the step. I mean, you know, if you're going to an out yard 60 miles away, you don't want to drive out there and find a queen today, you drive out there again release her 24 hours later and drive out there again to go graft, you just want to drive out there and graft, and that's fine. And you drive out there and have to look at a few frames to find the one you want, no big deal. On the other hand, if this is in your backyard, it might be less work to go out there and find the queen one night, let her go the next night, and, and already know where they're going to be when you go to, when you go to graft them. So you, you just kind of have to adopt it to your situation, what's going to work the best for you, because... <coughs> I do sometimes end up grafting from some out yard because I've got a queen out there I really like and I want some offspring from her and I don't want to make that many trips so I just go out there and find a frame and graft it. So, so keep that in mind. You don't have to confine it. It's not a requirement. It's just, it may or may not be more convenient for you. Yes. It would be better then to bring the ones that you want to say your yard so that you don't have to do all that. Uh, moving the hives is harder than grafting. <laughs> I don't know. Um, now, to me, it's easier to drive out there and graft a bunch of them out there than it is to move a hive because i got to load the hive up and seal it up. Uh, of course, I could probably just bring the queen back and introduce her to some nuke, but um, on the other hand, she's doing well there. I, I don't know. 
But anyway, just keep that in mind. This, this is not a requirement, but it may or may not be a convenience that would be useful for you. Um, but here, A3, you need to set up this. If you're setting up a hive to be a cell starter, rather than a, than a starter box, a starter hive, or a swarm box, or whatever you want to call it, if you're doing anything other than a swarm box, then you need to set it up on day three because you want them to be queenless long enough that they want to rear queen. So if you're just going to make a hive queenless as a cell starter, then this is the day you need to do that. If you're going to do a uh, swarm box, then on day four, two hours before you're going to graft, you need to shake them in that box and let them get settled in and then, and then do your transfer. I say transfer larva because if you're doing the gender or the Hopkins, you're not really grafting, but if you're doing grafting, then any way about it, you're getting the larvae into tufts that want the queens to want the rear queens in. Um, it's very helpful to feed a starter so, because they need to, they need to have plenty of food to feed this queen, and it also makes them accept the cells better. Um, probably diluted honey is a good bet. About two parts honey to one part water is probably your bet. I wouldn't water very much of it. I'd only water down what you're planning on feeding them right now because it won't keep very well. It'll spoil very quickly. Once you water honey down, it ferments very quickly. So just mix up what you're going to feed them and feed it to them. Tomorrow, if you're going to feed them again, you mix it up and feed it to them. When you're rearing queens, it's very helpful to keep a nice steady flow of something for them to work on. Unless there's an awfully good flow going on, it's, it's a good insurance policy that you're not going to suddenly decide to tear down all the cells. Okay? Now, uh, I don't usually water down honey to feed it. I usually feed it straight if I feed it because it keeps better. I don't like it spoiling. But in this case, it's, it's a better stimulation when you're trying to rear queens if you water down. They take it better. They take it quicker. They, they, it, it seems to keep them in, more in the mood I want them to be in. So I would water honey down to do this. I would water honey down if you're trying to feed them for the winter. In fact, the best thing to do for the winter is don't steal it in the first place. You don't have to feed it to them. That's, that's the best thing. But, um, but in this case, I would. I'd water it down about two to one. About two parts honey and one part water. And, and I would point out that Jay Smith and Doolittle and uh, Brother Adam and many of the men who have come before you would tell you but if you're trying to rear queens, you should be feeding them honey because anything else is substandard. <laughs> Just. But then you all, you all, right? Um, day 13, you need to set up the mating nukes. If, if, if you're going to be. You can at least start setting them up if you want. You don't have to. You, you could do it all on day 14. It's just that your odds won't be quite as good. If you make them queenless on 13, basically set up the nukes and now they've been queenless overnight by the time you put the cells in on day 14, you're probably going to have a higher acceptance rate. It takes you another trip. If it's a long trip to the bee yard, I would probably just go out and do it on day, all on day 14 and figure, well, it'll tear down a few of them. I'll look at that. Um, but if it's in my backyard, I'd probably make them queenless on 13. I'd set them up on 13 and do this on 14 for two reasons. It kind of lets me split up the work a little more. It's only, it's only in my backyard. I don't have to drive that far to get there. And, uh, and it ups my percentage of acceptance here. When I put the cells in, they're less likely to tear them down. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. But you can get by skipping this if it's in an out yard. Just go out and set them up with a queen cell. It, it'll work. They, they usually won't tear them down. And it'll work fine. Um, a lot of this stuff is just a question of stacking the deck. And it's a question of how much, it's, how much work and how many trips to a really distant out yard is it worth to stack the deck. Well, you know, depends. How far is it? <laughs> how much, how much uh, gas you can burn? Um, I can, I buy these calendars from uh, Better Bee. Mm. You, you put little pens in them to mark things. This says it's a virgin queen. This would be a cell. This would be a lay queen. This would be queenless. And this would be it needs something. It needs to be fed or it needs a super or it needs something done. Some, something needs to be done on this hive. That's what that O is. It's organized is what it stands for. And then you got numbers from 1 to 31. So I keep these on all my mating nukes, and the day I have marked there is always the day I expect her to be laying. So that's that's just, it's always a constant date. I always know what it means. Uh, you could change those dates depending on the status here. You could put in cell and set that to the day you think she's going to merge. And then when you go out and change it over to uh, Virgin, you change it to the day that you think she's going to be laying. And then when she's laying, you change that date to something else. Me, I, I figure it's easier just to set it once. That's the day I expect her to be laying. 
I can count backwards from that if I want to figure the rest of it out. You know? But that's up to you. Use it any way you want. But you'll probably need something like this if you're going to rear very many queens. Because if you're going to do a lot of batches of queens, it, can, it, it becomes difficult to keep track of, well, should this queen be laying yet? She's not laying yet. Is she a virgin that just emerged? Or has she been there for four weeks and she's still not laying? Or has she been... And I don't know what the status is if I don't have some way to keep track of it. And that's an easy way to keep track of it. Now you could make your own kind of calendar, your own kind of uh, whatever to keep track of it. But that day is the complicated thing that doesn't work very well just with the position of a brick or something. It is what day do I think she's going to be laying? So that's the calendar. So day 28, which I have marked whatever day 28 is going to be up there, I, I will expect her to be laying. Now, I may or may not leave her there. That's up to you. If you don't leave her there an extra week after she's laying so that she'll develop more ovaries, that's great. Go for it. But at least you know she's laying at that point. Um, and if you're a big queen producer at that point, if you want, you can pull her out and trip her as she's laying. Because that's, that's the point. You want to get to where she's laying. Um, now, I got listed on day 29. It's, uh, you can transfer her or do her whatever it is you're going to do with her. You can put her in a hive where you expect her to stay, dequeen that hive, and then 24 hours later, uh, put her in that hive, she'll probably be fine. You can probably direct release her if you throw a little smoke in there, and they'll probably never even notice her. Uh, but if you want, you can get fancy into a pushing cage or whatever you want to do for a release. Um, I see somebody writing furiously, maybe I'll let you uh, write a little more. Um, I mean, I'll talk more about mating nukes. I'll go ahead and start on mating nukes and I'll have some pictures in a minute here. But um, The life cycle of this rearing the queen is that they, the queen lays an egg, the egg hatches, they start turning it into a queen, right? They feed it, it gets capped, she emerges. It takes her several days just to, uh, and I don't have that on this calendar because I pretty much limited this calendar what it is you do. But what it is that happens is she emerges, it's, she's almost, some queens when they emerge are almost transparent. They're not, they're, there's a period of time in here that most queen breeders call hardening. They, they say the queen hardens. Well, she's, she's kind of transparent, really uh, fragile at first, and really needs to be fed. And a virgin queen tends to be really fast and flighty and hides, and, and you don't know what she's going to do. But it takes her several days She's really pretty small when she emerges. She's eating like crazy. She's still pretty small, clear up until she breeds. It comes back and starts to lay, really. But uh, there's, a, there's a hardening period in here for her to mature a little more after she emerges, before she starts to fly. And then she starts doing orientation flights for a few days, but she's got to fly maybe six, seven miles and find her way back. She can't just fly six or seven miles and know her way back. She's got to, she's got to get oriented. She's got to figure out what the train looks like. She's got to find landmark, she's got to learn her way around. So there's several days of her flying and, and getting stronger, her wings getting stronger so she can make that big long flight, and her getting oriented so she knows where she is. And then she'll eventually make that long flight and go mate. She might do that again the next day, she might do that again the next day, and then she's, she's done mating after that. She comes back and spends out her life in the hive, and although there's a little bit of speculation and a little bit of evidence to support that maybe on rare occasions, at a year or two, she might make another mating flight. I don't know of anything that would actually prove that for a fact. <laughs> Pretty much, people have been clipping queens for a long time. I, I know of some clipped queens that have lived for six or seven years, so, and they were still laying. So they, they don't need to ever go mating again, necessarily. Um, so that's stuff that's happening in the queen. Then. So the mating nuke is the place that she needs to be, she needs to be somewhere. Where when she emerges, she's not going to get killed. She's going to get accepted by the bees. She's going to get that chance to get fed and harden and fly out and mate and come back and then start laying eggs, right? So the normal method for this, if you don't know where this queen's going to end up, is to set up a mating. Now, if you're just requeening your hives, you can just mate them in the hive you're going to put them in if you want. You can dequeen the hive, put the queen cell in, she'll emerge, she'll mature, she'll go out and fly, she'll come back and she'll start laying. The problem is, you might even want to use a mating nuke under those circumstances for this reason. Sometimes they fly out and they get eaten by a swallow. They get eaten by a dragonfly. They get lost when they come back and they go in the wrong mating nuke and there's two virgin queens in there and one of them kills the other one. 
Um, lots of things can go wrong. Depending on the weather, I get anywhere from 90% of them that come back to 50% of them that come back. In, in a drought, I get a lot less of them come back. I don't know why. Uh, a lot of them don't want to fly in a drought. A lot of things change the percentage of that success. The advantage of mating them in a mating new, because at least I know I now have a mated queen who's back and she lived through it, and now if I want to introduce her to the hive, I, I'm less likely to have that risk of that she doesn't make it back. On the other hand, I have the added risk that they may not, might not accept her. They'll almost always accept the virgin emerging from the cell when they're queenless. So you have to play that game however you want to play it. But that's, that's why you might want to use mating. But if you're raising queens, you almost always want to mating. Now, this is my opinion, and I can give you. Uh, seven or eight queen breeders in the old books and probably a lot of queen breeders today who would, who would agree with me and I could probably find just as many who would disagree with me. So, you can make your own decision. They sell those cute little meeting nukes in the, in the catalogs. Mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't waste my money, that's my opinion. Here's a little mini meeting nuke here, uh, it's a picture from one of Jay Smith's books. Um, he experimented a lot with all of them and he ended up doing exactly what I did, which is two of whatever whatever brood frame you use, two of those in a mating room because it makes them easy to set up, it makes them easy to combine them in the fall, it's, it's, it, it will simplify your life greatly. But if you want to buy many, many mating nukes, the advantage to them is that it only takes a couple of bees to set up a mating room. But they fail at such a high rate as far as that they may all drop, they may all swarm out with the queen instead of staying in the hive, lots of things might happen. But this, it's not a natural size hive in any way, shape, or form. It's just such a small cavity that the bees are very likely to decide this is just not going to work and go try and find a better home. So I don't recommend them, but they do sell them, and obviously a lot of queen breeders use them with good success, so they would keep using them. Uh, I would plan on using your, whatever your standard frames are. The reason you use two of them is, first of all, more than one comb it really works out better than, new, than just one comb. And second of all, it allows you to put in some food and some brood. And if they've got food and they've got brood, they've got enough to set up a good mating. If you've only got brood, they're going to starve. If you've only got food, they aren't going to stay there. They're all going to fly back to the old hive and they're going to wander off to some other hive. But if you've got a frame of brood and a frame of honey, you can get them to stay there and you've got a mating to set up. So pretty much all my mating is are two medium frames because that's what I run for my brood. If you run deets, I would make them two deets. Because then you can go through your, you can take a hive here that's maybe not doing that well anyway, and uh, take a frame of brood and a frame of honey, and you've got one mating nuke, a frame of brood and a frame of honey, you got another mating nuke, a frame of brood, a frame of honey, you got another mating nuke. You do the mini mating nuke, you take a couple of bees and put them in here, and now try and feed them, get them to draw home, they got nothing. Try and get them to stay there, which they don't really want to do because there's nothing there to hold them there, and try and get them to accept a queen and get her mated. It's just a lot trickier. And then at the end of the season, I got these. These frames of brood and honey that don't fit in any of my hives. Now what do I do? Now if you live somewhere that the weather's mild enough you can overwinter them, go for it. It's great. <coughs> it's really kind of fun. Am I done? Um, so basically the cell phone mating is on day 14. This is a 10 frame box. I divide it up into four two frame mating nukes. Yeah. What you, what's the procedure for the division? How do you do it? Oh, to make, to divide it up? Yeah. Um, I'd probably do it differently than I did it here, but I'd do something close. This is a one by here, um, and it's it's rabbited into the ends. It's just sitting flat on the bottom. There's nothing in there. It's, it's, the problem with getting it to be tight is you can get it to sit flat on one side, but you can't get it to sit flat on all three sides. So I, I, figured, I try to get the bottom to just sit flat on the bottom, but then I try and wrap it on the ends because I can never get <coughs> the ends to exactly seal up. And then if, if, a, if the bees can get over here, they go over and kill this queen, and then I've lost the queen. So these are grabbing into here, and one of the reasons I don't one by is so I can do the canvas here. The canvas are some kind of an inner cover, whether it's canvas or wood, is necessary to keep them from spilling over to this one. When you open this one up, especially if it's a really like the second or third or fourth queens I'm raising, these are booming now. Because these queens have been laying in here, even if they're only laying for a little while, they take long to lay this full, and then I pull a queen out, I put another queen cell in, and then that's emerging, and this gets really full of bees, and then I open this one up. If I don't have this, they all start spilling over here, and then they start balling this queen over here, and that doesn't work out well. So the canvas is so that I can keep them separate. So I can open this one up, and they aren't spilling over into the next one. Um, and the canvas staples down nicely to the 
one by really easily to do this. This was actually a little crowded. I kind of wished I had gone with something skinnier than three quarters because it, it's just a little cramped. It's a little hard on someone getting that queen cell in between those two frames. I wish I had a little more clay to work with. Um, especially like on the ends here. If I get too close to this end here, then they think that's my exit for this one. If they can't get out the exit, then they're all going to die. So it's, i, I got to have enough room to get in there. And I'm just on the verge of, if it was any smaller, it'd be too small. I wish it was just a hair bigger, but, um, but that's just grabbing it into there. I'd probably use quarter inch lawn for this if I was doing it again. And I might even just use quarter inch lawn then to do this because it'd be difficult to staple the cloth to the divider if it was quarter inch. Where if I just leave this to stick up an extra quarter of an inch, then this would just butt up against that. And then this next one would fit between them, you know, down in between them. And the next one would fit down in between them. And that's probably what I'd do if I was doing it again, but I'm not going to rebuild them now. They're, they, they work and I've got them. So. So essentially, it's a five-frame box with, uh, you know, the brood and the honey two on each side with the fifth one. You know. So a maiden? Yeah. Is that ten, the, those are ten? You said these are these are two. No, but I mean the whole box is how how many frames? This is a ten frame. Okay. It's a ten frame box. It's only got eight frames in it because of the dividers. The dividers okay. take up space. But if I was doing it again, I'd do it out eight frame boxes because I just want eight frame boxes now. It would give me. I could put a standard, you know, it fit all my other equipment better, but um, I'd use whatever box you're using is what I would use. If, if you're using 10 frame boxes, I'd probably do this out of 10 frame boxes, because then if you ever wanted to, you just pull all these out and use it for a box. You, have a, you, have a, you don't have a wasted piece of equipment laying around. But I'd use whatever you're using. But you can also, Miller made this argument, and it's a good argument. He said, he, he wished he'd never even bothered building maintenance. He said, just take a regular box and build a follower board because then I, I had messed up with my use, use one box for each mating loop. And I, yeah, I got that wasted space on there, but hey, it's just a standard box. I can use it for something else later. It's not like it's going to go to waste. And, and then that's a reasonable argument. If you don't need a thousand mating nukes, it's a reasonable argument. You use one of her box then. Yeah, he just did one for box because hey, I can use the boxes for something else later. So. Yeah. Um, you guys about queen banks. Here's uh, some queen bank frames. Basically, what what you typically do is you pull them out once they're laying. Sometime between when they started laying or a week after they started laying, depending on how much you want to let them develop. And you, you don't want to let them. You don't want to take a queen. I'll say this because this is uh, something I've kind of become aware of as time's gone on. Is uh, you don't want to take a queen from a strong hive who's been laying up a storm and just pull her out and stick her in a queen bank. It's really hard on her. You don't want to take her out to the shipper either. You want to take her out and put her in a little mating nuke where she can't lay as much to let her cut back on laying and kind of slow down gradually. And then you can put her in here. Otherwise, you kind of damage her. It's like taking a milk cow and all of a sudden you quit milking her. You know, you just it's not a good idea. You, you, you'd be better off to find a little more gradual approach. Um, so anyway, you put the queens in here. Basically, you need the easiest way to set up a queen, a queen bank, from my point of view, is you get a frame of brood and a frame of honey from this hive, a frame of brood and a frame of honey from this hive, a frame of brood and a frame of honey from that hive, and you put all the brood in the middle and the honey on the outside, and, and uh, let them sit there for a couple hours to figure out the queen list, and then put a whole, and then fill this, fill this hole. Go catch all your queens out of all your nukes, put them all in here, and put that whole thing in at one time. And that works pretty well. They know their queen list, they have no loyalty to any of these queens, they've never met any of these queens. They have no particular loyalty to each other because they just met each other two hours ago, and they're just kind of in turmoil. So they don't really know who the queen is. So they're not—they're not really in the mood to kill any of them. They're not really in the mood to—they're in the mood to have a queen, and you just gave them a bunch of them, and so they're just kind of, oh, okay, I guess we'll take care of this. Um, yeah. Would I'm—I'm kind of curious with the kind of go, going back, taking what you just said, and going back one step. Instead of the divider boards between the mini mating nukes within a big box, could you do something with a queen excluder? So that the queens couldn't get across and the no, and the no. it's the bees getting across and they'll kill the other queen. Okay. Um, so basically the what I wouldn't do is don't take a bunch of more queens and stick in the same bank. You got a bunch of more queens set up in the bank, but then what the problem is these queen these bees get kind of used to these queens, and then you give them a bunch of new queens, it, it disrupts everything. So now they don't know who these queens are, and they do know who these queens are, and now they're trying to say, well, do we like these new queens better? They they, they smell pretty good. They make queens kill they usually either kill all the old ones or all the new ones. So, yeah. 
Uh, I, I think I'm done here anyway, except uh, 